Okay. Good day, everyone, and especially to our speaker, Ruth Mostern from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to this talk on her book, The Yellow River, um, which is part of the Yale Center Beijing, Yale University Press, Find Your Next Great Read series. I'm also very excited to share with you that um, Professor Mostern's book is going to be translated into Chinese. And so stay tuned um, at our WeChat account um, for news about when her book is coming out in China. Um, so today the book is on her book, um, which is um, published by the Yale University Press called The Yellow River, A Natural and Unnatural History. For those of us who grew up here in China, we've always learned about the Yellow River as the cradle of our civilization, the mother river. Um, and Professor Ruth Mostern, have done some very, she has done from some really interesting work weaving together um, multiple disciplines from Neolithic times to the present day, the Yellow River and its watershed have both shaped and been shaped by human society. So she uses the Yellow River to illustrate the long-term effects of environmentally significant human act activity um, and unravels the long history of human relationship with water and soil and the consequences, which are at times disastrous and um, of ecological transformations that resulted from human decisions. Um, um, Professor Mosser and I were just chatting that this could be a book about COVID um, and many of the seismic changes that we've going, been going through um, in the world and in this society. And today we're so grateful to be able to have her um, talk about this book, um, the transformation, the ecological history, and the profound conclusions that we could draw um, from how the natural system um, evolved and how um, we shape the natural system in good and bad ways. Professor Ruth Mostern is Professor of History and Director of the World History Center at the University of Pittsburgh. She is the author of two books, Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern the Spatial Organization of the Song State, 960 to 1276 CE, and The Yellow River, which is um, what we're gonna talk about today. She's the author or co-author of over 30 articles published in books and peer-reviewed journals. She's the principal investigator and project director of the World Historical Gazetteer, which is a prize-winning digital infrastructure platform for integrating databases of historical place name information. Her research has been funded by entities that include the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities, the U.S. National Science Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and others. Today's event will go as follows. Professor Boston will be giving a presentation, and then I will invite our Zoom participants to comment and post questions in the chat box as they pop up. I, will, I would like to invite all of you um, to stay muted for now. And um, depending on the time we get um, in the remaining um, after her, in the remaining time after her presentation, I may either unmute you or um, in the interest of, of time, I may um, pose the questions that you pose in the chat box. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this talk and I hope you are too. And without further ado, let's welcome Professor Ruth Moster. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much for that um, kind introduction. I am so happy to be with you today and to talk about my book. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I'm talking today, um, as, uh, as Carol said, about my book published about a year ago, The Yellow River, A Natural and Unnatural History. And I wanna start by introducing to you a version of a map which in some ways is probably very familiar to you. In other ways, I think provides a different perspective on the Yellow River, a river that you see um, on all of the maps of China that you peruse. And you can see here on this map, the river itself is vis visible. If you can see my cursor, right? You can see the line of the river. But my intention on this map and in all my work is to ask, what if instead of seeing the river as a line of water passing through a dry landscape, 
<coughs> to instead see it as part of an entire watershed. And so that's what you see here is the entire watershed of the Yellow River, including the headwaters of the river in the far west, in Qinghai at the edge of the Tibetan Plateau, including outlined here in white, this is such an important part of the story I'm telling here, is the Les Plateau, and then to the east of the Les Plateau, the alluvial plain of the river in East China. And so in addition to all of the watershed of the river, you can also see here the range of soil types, vegetation cover actually, um, around the uh, on the river, which includes in light green arable land, in dark green forests and highland places, in dark brown, sort of medium toned brown is grasslands, and in yellow is desert. And so this shows, I think, really vividly so much about the history of the river, which is a history of people expanding agriculture wherever agriculture can be expanded, um, while also um, uh, placing settlements on grasslands and also dealing with the sort of um, complex multi-ethnic world of these sort of ecotone regions, these transition regions between grassland and desert. And so this is the river, but it's the river depicted, I hope, in a novel and thought-provoking way. One other version of the same watershed here focusing again on this dynamic relationship between the Les Plateau um, in um, Shanxi, part of Shanxi, Gansu, and the alluvial plain to the east. And here focusing on the fact that over the course of prehistoric and recorded history, um, the river, as, as, as I'm sure all of you know, has changed course many, many times, has really occupied the entirety of the alluvial plain, sometimes in multiple simultaneous courses, sometimes in successive courses. Historically, the entirety of the Yellow River Plain here would have been lakes, wetlands, marshes, multiple tributaries, a shallow river through a very flat landscape that can meander across all of that territory. And one of the other things that I stress sort of as I look at this map is that when the river does that, it's not doing something disastrous, right? Does it, so the behavior of the river, which is just simply to be water, occupying a world in the context of ecosystems and in the context of the dynamics of gravity, right? The river is just being the river. And that behavior only becomes something that people see as problematic and disastrous at the point that they are building cities, expanding agriculture, and doing the things that they have to do in order for that to be successful, like building levees, extinguishing wetlands, and so on. So this is the view of the river that I am presenting in my book. I like to say that this is a book that is about soil as much as it's about water. Um, it's about the way that human activity on the Les Plateau causes erosion and the way that that eroded less soil makes its way into the river to, down to the floodplain and is then as the um, level of the riverbed rises is the source of the floods that are so much of the dynamic of the way that people talk about, about uh, the Yellow River. And this quote that I have here in the bottom right side of my slide is a really important piece of what I'm doing here. And it's from a couple of environmental scientists. I read a lot of environmental science as well as works of history and as well as doing geographical analysis. And the idea is that less is very resistant to erosion under vegetation cover, but readily erodible without it. And what this is telling us is that the history of erosion, the history of the rising sediment in the Yellow River is a history of 
the removal of ground cover on the Les Plateau. Um, and the um, uh, microscopic image that you can see on the top right hand side of this slide is demonstrating that the reason why um, sort of a significant characteristic of less soil is that it's comprised of tiny grains of multiple shapes, which means that it is a sort of a very loose type of soil when it's covered with ground cover. It's also why it can so easily just sort of blow away through um, wind and water processes as a fine dust. Also why it has um, historically, as, as many of you probably know, in imperial times been used as a building material, as hard as concrete, there's still um, pounded, less soil structures visible in the landscape across this region. And um, the series of photos on the, le on the left, I call my less selfies, and that's um, just uh, me holding a clump of the soil and demonstrating that it can um, just uh, easily, you know, kind of fall apart into this fine windborne dust. Um, and so another piece of this story, um, of course, or another way of saying that same piece of the story is that the amount of erosion on the Les Plateau throughout the Yellow River Basin has changed dramatically over time. And this is another one of the insights that I've acquired from reading the work of environmental scientists. And so the chart you see here is um, derived from soil cores taken um, throughout the, the basin um, that contain enough organic material that it's possible to date when different um, when soil was deposited and to come up with a 12,000 year timeline of changing erosion rates, which begin in at the end of the Ice Age in the Pleistocene era with low erosion, um, which rises only a little bit during the, climate, the Holocene climatic optimum. This is the period from about 9,000 to 6,000 years ago when people started engaging in agriculture. It was a warm and moist time. Agriculture in that era, of course, was not very intensive. And also the ability of vegetation to regrow was really high. The story really takes off during the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. So um, basically from the Neolithic into the, um, the Western Zhou, the Warring States period, when you can see rapidly rising rates of erosion as people started engaging in more intensive agriculture, um, in deforestation in order to power forges and mills, and um, then really um, dramatically, you can see this uh, very, very rapid raise in the right rate of erosion during the imperial age. Um, always there were low rainfall years. There's a relationship um, because the human impact on erosion was so profound, it really overtakes climate impacts. Um, that's something that became really clear that I did not expect to find when I began this research. But, um, and so long-term trends in climate don't make much of a difference, but always each year's weather is really significant. There are always years of low rainfall when there is much less erosion, much less of a risk of flooding, as well as high rainfall years when um, really um, accumulations of sediment could all wash into the river at once. This is another version of the same data. And what I really want to stress here, um, again, this is the 12,000 year time frame. You can see on the vertical axis, this is a sort of a logarithmic chart. So it's sort of orders of magnitude of increase in the amount of sediment with really this interesting rupture point about a thousand years ago when the rate of increase um, kind of went up by a whole order of magnitude. And so there's basically a sort of a pre-Song story of the river and a kind of a post-Song version of the river. This is actually a version of this chart is the um, thing that I saw that really started me on this whole um, research project because I was at that time finishing a book about the, finishing writing a book about the Song dynasty that was partly about 
the Song colonization of the Northwest and the Song Shixia War. And so I started this research, the research for the Yellow River book, wondering if there was a way that that story, that story of the Song Shixia War was perhaps more significant um, as a part of the Yellow River story as well than had been visible to previous scholars. And so to conclude a couple of the propositions that I'm bringing to this book. One is the idea that rivers are sediment sorting machines. That is that rather than thinking about them as lines of water in a landscape, we can think of them as um, sort of large ecosystem entities that are involved with carrying organic and inorganic material downhill by the force of gravity. Another from uh, Richard White, the idea that rivers have biographies, that they're not always the same thing, that they themselves are the agents and the subjects of historical change. And then the third, this um, paradoxical statement that I love from Mark Elvin, environmental historian, <laughs> that China has experienced 3,000 years of unsustainable growth. And I love that idea that when we think of unsustainability, we think of something that just can't be sustained. And yet when we think of 3000 years of growth, we're thinking that just the opposite. We're thinking, wow, this is an amazing amount of just um, like civilizational su sustenance, right? And so this history that I'm telling is really kind of pivoting on that paradox. So um, how this is another view of the question of how erosion proceeded on the Les Plateau, basically from this point of view in three different phases. So it's not a gradually rising rate of erosion as I've been explaining. It's a matter of sort of one pulse in the Neolithic, a second pulse in the Western Han and a third pulse that starts in the Northern Song. And this is really um, tying that to rates of deforestation over time from an estimated um, amount of forest cover. And again, this is um, partially derived from historical sources, partially derived from looking at um, remains of pollen in soil cores, 50% um, um, tree coverage on the Les Plateau in the Western Zhou, um, declining to 33% um, by the Tang and Song, 15% by the end of the imperial era. And um, of course now, as, as many of you know, as all of you know, I'm sure a um, really um, sustained re-greening effort. Um, so what does that, so, so this is basically what I'm really trying to stress is a couple of things. One is how much the story of the Yellow River is a story about the Les Plateau. Another is that that story is a story of human settlement. Um, I've done a lot of database design work and spatial analysis. What you see here on the, bo the bottom right includes some um, archaeological in information about Han and Xiongnu cemeteries. The two images on the left come from the um, Great Tan Xixiang Historical Atlas, the Zhongguo Lishu Di Tu Ji, the Historical Atlas of China, and it's um, showing the expansion of um, settlements from the uh, from from the top, um, the Qin times, bottom is Han times, and you can see the settlements expanding towards the north and west in the Ordos, the Great Bend of the Yellow River during the Han. Um, and this is um, just an ex a couple of things I think I want to talk about with these images. One is um, the way that this less soil was used as a building material. This is um, just outside of Xi'an, right? The, of course, the Han capital of Chang'an, showing the way that that soil was used to build reservoirs and waterworks and levees as early as the as the Tang, as, sorry, as early as the Han. And then on the right, the Jing River near its confluence with the Wei, showing that it lies far below the level of the surrounding farmland, which was not the case in the Qin and Han period, and is now running through sort of bare rocky landscape, not through the um, kind of meters of 
um, rich soil that would have existed at the time that these structures were built. By uh, by middle period times, and as I've stressed, this is really what I'm most interested in, is this pulse of dramatic increase of erosion that occurred during the Song and was really associated with the um, Song Shishia War. And you can see that really dramatically if you look at these maps, with map A at the top right part of the slide showing the distribution of settlements that existed in the Tang in the mid eighth century. This is um, right before the Anlushan Rebellion, the expansion of settlements in the early Northern Song. And then really significantly, I want you to focus on that image C at the bottom right hand side of the slide. This is what the distribution of settlements looks like in 1111 right before the fall of the Northern Song. And the uh, stars represent prefectures. These are the larger government units. These are like Fu and Zhou, right? The um, diamond shape icons represent counties. And then those black dots, those small black circles, and again, this is from the Historical Atlas of China, the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Tu Ji, these are units below the level of the county in this sort of three, um, three level administrative hierarchy of the Song Dynasty. And so these are forts, garrisons, postal stations, um, horse farms, villages, right? But a lot of them, a lot, a lot of them are military fortifications. And of course, it was not until the Ming that there was such a thing as the Great Wall. But the idea in the Northern Song was that these garrisons along the northern border of the Song, which is what you see there running right across the uh, middle of the Ordos region, those garrisons should be close enough that they should be visible one to the next for signal fires. They essentially formed a wall and they did so right along the fragile grasslands region of this highly erodible soil that I've been telling you about. Um, and this is the region we're talking about. Basically, the um, this is the uh, the um, um, the Wuding River, the major tributary of the Yellow River that runs through the grasslands region. The image that you see on the left depicts what that. Um, the highly eroded, dissected landscape looks like today. This is um, just outside the city of Yulin. Um, and so what this looked like, and this is just kind of uh, reiterating what I was just talking about, which is that in the year the great, we can really pinpoint to the exact decade when this highly erosion causing um, military strategy was put in place. And it was during the war between 1040 and 1041 when the number of people and horses in the Ordos um, increased from um, 34,000 horses and 155,000 people to 500,000 troops. Um, 32,000 imperial soldier, well, from 32,000 soldiers to 500 battalions, 500,000 troops, 300,000 cavalry. This is the intensive moment of, um, of fortification that occurred in this region. And this continued on, of course, in the Ming through the Great Wall era. Um, so by, well, I should say, actually, I want to focus for just a second on the top right hand map that you see here from 1330. This is during the Yuan, during the Mongol era. And um, one of the things I try to be really attentive to in my book is not just to tell this story as if it's one of things getting worse and worse, what environmental historians call declensionism, right? As, as historians, and especially as environmental historians, we always want to make sure that things stay complicated. And so the era in which um, the Jin and the Yuan controlled North China, when there wasn't an adversarial relationship between an ethnically Han regime in the Ordos and on the Les Plateau, and between pastoralists, for riding and mobile people to the north during that period of the um, 1100s, 1200s, 
1300s, this was a time when there was low population on the less plateau, when there was the opportunity for forests and grasslands to regrow um, prior to a sort of another pulse of fortification and development in the Ming and Qing. And what that looks like then is something like the picture on the bottom right, and of course the map, this 16th century map, same time period of the building of the Great Wall, again, right through this most fragile grasslands region of the Les Plateau, and then onward to the Qing, when for the first time, and really I think the lasting success of the Ming Great Wall era was not so much that it was a good military strategy, clearly it was not, but that during that period is when for the first time the Chinese part of the Ordos became a sort of enclosed agricultural ethnically Han space, um, a space where agriculture could be conducted in as intensive a fashion as the um, ec ecology made possible. And so, um, and then of course in the 16th century, 16th, 17th century is when the new world crops, the maize and potatoes came in. Those were really amenable to being farmed in this region. Um, Forestry, I, I haven't talked very much about forestry, but um, commercial forestry, commercial salt production, commercial production of um, cotton, all of these things were transformative in this region and um, allowed for a very, very high increase in the density of the population clearly depicted here on this map. In progress, um, and this is really, really in progress, this is work I am literally doing this week with a um, um, Chinese graduate student from um, Jianmin University who is visiting me at Pitt this year, Su Rao Rao, and um, he and I have begun some new GIS analysis based on the uh, the Atlas of Cultural Sites in Chinese History, and um, so what you can see here on the right, and this is the Jing River sub basin um, is um, on the right hand side, showing the density county by county of the number of cultural sites. So that's a sort of a proxy for development. And then on the left, um, sort of the bottom right of the four slides, um, the four images of the river basin, the um, likelihood of any particular location in the Jing River Basin, Jing River sub-basin, right? This is the Jing flows into the way, which flows into the yellow, um, the likelihood of erosion arising from any particular location. And you can see, um, and there's a really high correlation between some of the places that were most densely settled in the Jing River region and some of the places where that would have been the most prone for erosion. And so we're going to continue sort of drilling into this data as much as we can over the next few months in order to further extend the analysis that I began in my book. So um, switching gears, and I think I'll go through this very quickly. Um, I've alluded to the fact that I did a lot of data development. I was one of the other things that influenced me really early on in this research was coming across the Huanghe Nianbiao, the Yellow River Annals, um, compiled by Shen Yi in the 1930s, um, which is just a list of thousands of events connect with Yellow River history. And this is mostly focused now on pivoting toward the downstream part of the story. So on the upstream, I have data um, from the Zhongguo Lishu Di Chu Ji about the history of settlements, the establishment of settlements on the upstream part of the river. I also, uh, beginning with uh, Huanghe Nianbiao, although extending far beyond that, also have a database of events on the lower course of the river. And um, <clears throat> from those events, I was able to create a really complex database. And um, one, again, this is, I um, wanna acknowledge my database superstar collaborator and expert, Ryan 
horn um, and um, who is able to run these really complex queries on the database in order to see some of the patterns and some of the surprises. Um, we're also, as a, as a part of this work, and here I want to acknowledge um, one of my uh, fantastic graduate students here at Pitt, Sharon John Zhang, who is doing the final work of creating a gazetteer of locations that are mentioned anywhere in this material. That's the final step prior to publishing this, which we hope to do in the coming months. I want to, with this slide, just kind of note the fact that every one of these points in the database, entities in the database, locations on a map, all of these ultimately walk back to original primary sources. This is still historical scholarship, even though my goal is to really scale up to thousands of years and the entire river basin. And just a little bit more information about what this looks like from the point of view of the gazetteer. So I wanna now pivot to talking about the downstream part of the river um, from ancient times, imperial times to the present, the challenge of living on the floodplain has been the challenge of what to do with all that eroded sediment. One of the things that I can derive from my database is the locations of all of the floods, all of the disasters, and also all of the acts of river management, building levees, building drainage canals, repairing waterworks that have occurred at any time as reported in historical sources. And if you just throw them all together on a map, it looks something like this. And you can see the way that the floodplain is this sort of fan, this kind of triangle of um, locations of scrutiny across all of the historical courses of the river, um, focusing many of which fan out from the city of Kaifeng. Kaifeng is at the western edge of the floodplain. It's the first place that those sediment-laden waters appear kind of as they disgorge from the mountains one final time and enter the floodplain. Um, Kaifeng is in a low-lying basin. This is in part what, why, what made it so appealing as the capital of the Northern Song um, because it was so easy to build canals into Kaifeng from the south, but it also has made it very, very prone to flooding. As you can see, this image is from an archeological site, a geoarchaeology site. So this is sort of excavating layers of um, sediment deposited during floods around the site of the historical Kaifeng city wall. And then um, derived from my data, um, the um, depiction of the many different courses of the river that have passed through and around the city of Kaifeng and the many floods that affected the region right around the city. You can also take that same data and depict it in the form of a timeline. And this shows us something really interesting. One, and um, of course, this is tied to the famous work many years ago by Tan Chi Xiang, who was the first person to notice that there wasn't much flooding on the Yellow River from um, between the Han and the Song. And my work absolutely reinforces what he discovered. So there's a long region of low flooding that actually ends really during the Five Dynasties period, the Wudai, the Wudai period, a little bit before the start of the Song. Um, and then this region, this period of the first period of intensive flooding that occurred during the Song, a third period, a, a second period of intensive flooding during the Yuan and Ming. I want to kind of draw attention also to the fact that during the Southern Song and Jin period, I do not think it's the case that there was not flooding. I think just the opposite. I think that there was, um, in a sense, so much sort of um, un, kind of unmanaged river um, but also so little border crossing that it's just not something that record keepers were playing, uh, paying close attention to. And then a really interesting, and again, sort of in part of my work of saying, you know, this isn't always a story about things getting worse and worse. You can see that there's a really interesting period in the late Ming and Qing when there was actually less flooding. 
And um, that, as I'll talk about more in a few minutes, is really an example of very, very effective state policy about flood control, really effective infrastructure management. And um, that's another story that I think is not really always told or put in good perspective. The dotted line that you can see here is um, from a data set called the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas. And so that um, depicts from year to year how much rainfall there was. And so another thing that's really interesting that you can see is that basically each of these pulses of significant flooding occurred during a period of high rainfall, except during the late Qing. That's the first time when the flood history and the rainfall history were not really directly correlated with one another. I think I'm going to skip over this slide in the interest of time. Really what I want to zero in on I'll just say a couple of words really quickly. One is that this um, shows really vividly on the top slide um, the fact that there was this long, long, long reported history prior to the flood era. In fact, even the floods during the Han, sort of in the Western Han, Eastern Han transition, um, although they're very politically significant, really significant to the larger um, story of Chinese history, they actually were really not numerous by the standards of later imperial times. The other thing, and I won't sort of go into the whole analysis of this, is that this shows the building of levees and the percentage of recorded disasters over time. This is what you see on the bottom image the percentage of recorded disasters that were recorded as being levy breaches. That is what this is showing is that there are certain kinds of things that the river did just because rivers sometimes have high water, right, that could only be considered as being disasters once people started building levees and embankments and other kinds of water control infrastructure. And so this is really trying to kind of problematize and complicate what we're talking about in the first place when we even talk about disasters on the river. Um, and then again, you can see um, sort of embedded in this data, um, which is, is explained more fully in the book, this period of really effective river management during the 18th century. Um, and this one again shows the fact that moisture levels correlate with flooding until they don't, until this extraordinary moment in the Qing, this period um, from the late, almost exactly kind of um, correlating with the years of um, effective Qing control until the Opium War in the mid 19th century, um, that this is the first time ever in history when the black line, this is a line that represents um, infrastructure building, levy repair, levy maintenance, levy building, um, that that black line of water of water works maintenance is, is consistently for over a hundred years, for almost 200 years, there is more water works maintenance than there are disasters. The disasters are the white lines. And you can see that in earlier times, there's always the number of disasters and the number of repairs are almost exactly tracking to each other, but there's always more disaster than repair until this extraordinary period in the Qing. And so that's another thing that I focus on a lot in the book. There's this sort of Song era, Northern Song era of massive buildup of fortifications on the Les Plateau and the first era of significant river disasters. And then there's this Qing era of extraordinary waterworks maintenance. And those are really two big turning points in the story that I'm telling. Um, this again, another view, this is um, basically the sort of the broad middle period, the seventh century to the 
uh, to the 15th century, showing that in that period before massive waterworks building, the number of disasters is always tracking to the amount of moisture. That is, people have not yet figured out how, how to have a policy regime and how to do waterworks construction that kind of frees life on the, on the floodplain from the pulses of wet and dry. Um, and that's just showing that there's all, wait, I guess in the tongue, right, I, that's right. In the tongue, you can see that even when there was a very wet period, there was not flooding. In the Northern Song, there was a really high correlation between, between um, rain and flooding. And by the Ming, once again, the late Ming, that's the early Ming. By the Ming, once again, that correlation between rainfall and floods was starting to be broken. So this is another way of telling this sort of long history of what it's like for people to live along the river. And I think I'll, um, that sort of reiterates what I've been saying already about this, the 18th century. So as we move toward the end of this talk, I want to make a couple of points. Again, some of the um, quotations that have really guided my thinking and my philosophy about this river um, from Gilbert White, great American hydrologist in the mid 20th century, this idea that floods are acts of God, right? Meaning that floods are just natural. They're about rainfall, carrying sediment downstream, high, high, high water levels, sediment settling in riverbeds that rise and rise. That's acts of God but that flood losses are largely acts of man. And so what this means is that until you have dense populations, until you have levee building, until you decide that there are regions of human settlement that you are willing in society to sacrifice, right? There's no such thing as a flood loss. Um, and I really want to draw attention, I think I have there, um, so this is a map of the waterworks, the Chinko waterworks around Hongzhou Lake, which were very, very important to the maintenance of the Grand Canal, and I guess I have not said in this version of the talk, right, why was there such an investment in water work during the Qing? The answer is basically to make um, transportation on the Grand Canal efficient. And this Qingko Water Works was the um, centerpiece of that um, flood control system that protected the Grand Canal. And as you can see here, and um, you can see on the historical map, and you can also see in the landscape um, this was a terrific trip that I took to Hongzhou Lake right before the COVID pandemic began. This was the winter of 2019 um, that you can see that um, there is literally water that um, could um, rise in the lake during times of high water that was just disgorged out onto the landscape. Um, if there were people living and farming in this region, woe unto them, right? This was where that water would be disgorged in order to protect the Grand Canal, the interests of the state and the interests of transportation between North and South China. I always want to end my slides with something um, like this. I always end my talks by moving back to the human scale again. It's really easy, I think, for me, um, operating at the level of thousands of years of history, you know, where each of these floods is just a dot on a map, each of these levee repairs is just a dot on a map, to remember that these are also stories about people, that every one of these floods was something that displaced individuals from their home, that killed people, that made people into refugees, that destroyed their livelihood. Each of these acts of levy repair was perilous labor by low paid people working in freezing winter temperatures because that's when it wasn't raining. Um, I mean, that's when it was the most dry in order to repair the levees. And so I just want to draw our attention a little bit to the fact that although my work is really sort of up at high structures, these are millions of human stories lying below all of those dots on the map. Um, again, this has been a book talk. This is the information about my book available 
through Yale University Press, certainly I'm currently in the midst of being translated into Chinese. I'm not sure exactly what the time frame is for that. And then um, finally, also, this is all tremendously collaborative work. It's work that I cannot complete without um, people who know how to um, make databases and students who have helped me compile and organize all of the data that you've seen and um, people who have helped to guide me on my field trips through the territory that I'm interested in. And so I want to end this talk by acknowledging all of their work. So um, thank you all for your time. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I'm happy to take questions. Terrific, thank you so much for um, that um, very encyclopedic and fascinating talk. Um, although there, I mean, I just feel like every slide we can probably talk for half an hour or more. Um, and actually, um, and, and please, for everyone who have questions, please feel free to type, the, type them in the chat box. Um, I'm gonna start with some questions that um, were pre-submitted um, when uh, folks registered for this program. Um, the first one being, and this is um, actually linked to one of your earlier slides um, that kind of showed pre-song and after-song and the sediment rates um, in log logarithmic scale. Um, I think there was a question about um, why did you decide to study the Yellow River in this way? And when did you start paying attention? Um, and how, how did you come up with the way you approached um, the study of the history of the Yellow River? Right. So my first book, um, I think I mentioned briefly, but I, I love answering this question. My first book, um, which was based on my PhD dissertation, was um, Dividing the Realm in Order to Govern, um, the Spatial History of the Song State, was used some of these same methods. So it was also based on data and spatial analysis. And what I was interested in doing in that book was to, I mean, I zeroed in on the fact that during the Song era, Northern and Southern Song, um, that the number and location of counties and prefectures, so these units of local and regional government, um, changed a lot. Um, one of the pieces of the Song uh, political toolkit was to found new counties, abolish old counties, found new prefectures, abolish old prefectures, and to sort of constantly be renovating what I call the political landscape. And that by doing this same kind of work that I've just presented here, by making maps and timelines, it was possible to see some spatial and temporal patterns in those activities. And so it was very, very much a book of, his, of um, historical geography, but it was about entirely a human created landscape. And so as I was finishing that book, I knew that I wanted to do something that also was about historical geography and use some of these same data oriented methods, but was more anchored in the sort of um, ecological world. And I had gotten really interested in water. I was living in a sort of um, arid and um, unpredictably flooded part of California at the time. So I was starting to study uh, water history and think about water history. And, um, you know, I was, I did a couple of sort of test experiments to see whether I could correlate any of what I knew about counties and prefectures in the Song with um, the big, you know, year 1048, the big year 1048 course change in the Yellow River and um, realized that there was a whole story that I had missed in my first book, that there was a sort of a story of how much water history had affected the distribution of local government and population and state power in the Song. And that's what kind of got me going on the project that I've presented here. Super, thank you for that um, very interesting answer. Um, and we're so glad that it took you to um, this work. Um, we have a question uh, from the audience about um, 
what do you think contributed to the intensive um, water control levee building measures in the Qing dynasty? I remembered you alluded to um, the management of the canal, um, but if you could elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, that's really, you know, I think a lot about the sort of, um, there was a, a lot, maybe, you know, over a century of disputation in the Ming about what to do on the Yellow River floodplain. And, um, you know, there was one sort of direction of policy during the Ming that said, let's build, right, this is not something that was technologically impossible. It's not something that was fiscally impossible, right? Let's build, you know, levees, canals, channelize the river, make the Grand Canal predictable, you know, spend that money and do that thing, right? That, you know, which ultimately is what happened during the Qing. Um, and so that, you know, there were people proposing that as early as the 1500s, late 1400s, right? And then there was another sort of group of people who said, you know what, there's all these wetlands, there's all these sort of small canals, shallow tributaries, transportation from the south to the north is fine, we can leave things as is, not do massive intervention, let the river be the river. What it means is that we have to hire sort of local experts to kind of navigate these barges through this um, sort of frequently changing and dynamic water landscape, but we can do that, that's okay, right? And so um, that second point of view is the one that was followed during most of the Ming. Um, in the late Ming, the other sort of um, kind of high interventionist groups started to become more powerful and really in the Qing entirely took hold. And, um, and I think often about this, that there's not any, right, again, in this sort of anti-declensionist way of thinking, you know, that there's an alternate history, a sort of a path not taken, where that Ming idea of let's live with the river, Let's live with the fact that there are different amounts of water in the river at different times. There are different courses in the river at different times. We can um, have lower populations on the floodplain. We can honor the local expertise of the people who dwell in this flood in this floodplain region, this wetlands region, and rely on them rather than being a giant government that tries to fix everything. Right. Um, and so I, I as I said, I, th I think often about what would happen if that sort of Ming approach to the river was the one that continued to be in place during the Qing as well. Thank you. Um, we had a question submitted by um, a researcher at um, Zhongke Yuan, uh, who studies um, natural science history, um, the, the history of natural sciences. And he asks about kind of um, the tributaries of the tributaries of the Yellow River, for example, with the tributaries of Weihe and Fenhe um, for thousands of years um, has created lots of downcutting and a very kind of um, remarkable landscape with deep valleys. Um, why do you think that is? Right. Well, you know, and that's what I, I I had one slide of my very, very most recent work, um, which is looking on the Jinghe Basin, right? The Jinghe, which is the tributary of the Weihe, which is the tributary of the Honghe, right? Um, and so looking at this sort of sub-sub basin of the Jinghe and um, looking, and of course, um, you know, only with modern satellite data, because that's, we live in the modern world, right? Um, trying to look at what the contemporary terrain in the Jinghe region, in the Jinghe Basin, looks like. And one of the things, um, working with this super talented grad student who's visiting with me at Pitt this year, one of the things that we're going to do with the um, Wenwu uh, um, um, Tituji is to look at where the locations were of historical settlements 
Actually, we're not going to necessarily get this from the Wen Wu Di Tu Ji because that's based on excavated information, but with a combination of historical gazetteers, defang zhi, historical documents, um, the Wen Wu Di Tu Ji, we're going to figure out where settlements in the past were located in places that no longer can support settlements. And so this will allow us to kind of work backwards from contemporary erosion maps, right, that show these sort of deep and narrow valleys that the um, that the question referred to, and to figure out whether that is always what the terrain looked like, or whether in the past we know that there were farms, settlements, springs, tributaries, routes of transportation in places that now can no longer support them. So, um, so that really exactly gets at the question of my current research. That's amazing. Um, and going back to uh, one of the earlier questions about how you started this research uh, and the Song Dynasty, all the um, kind of migrations and the moving and building and destruction of prefectures and you know all of that. Um, in the work that you have done so far, um, you know, if there's a way to characterize how much of it is the river shaping where people are settling um, and uh, settling for agriculture, tilling the land, using the land versus how much people are shaping <laughs> the floods, the Yellow River, the direction, the levees, um, you know, where are you seeing, you know, where do you, where are you seeing the balance or, you know, kind of, you know, what, what's the percentage of one affecting the other, or is it kind of a constant evolution of, you know, sometimes it's more nature and sometimes it's more about policies and human actions. Right. That's a terrific question. And, um, you know, if I could find a way to sort of quantify it, which it sounds like is what the question is looking at, that would be really interesting. But I think in some ways it's unquantifiable. I mean, as the end of the question sort of implies, you know, I mean, humans, I guess part of one of the philosophies of environmental history as a field is that humans and human activity, human policy, human society is not outside of nature. It's not separate from the landscape. And so it's not like here are people and here is nature, you know, what happens when they, right, when you put them together. Instead, it's saying, here's one ecosystem. It includes humans and their roads and cities and farms and ambitions and settlements. And it includes water and dirt and animals and rainfall, right? And that what you seek to study as an environmental historian is how the landscape, the whole landscape and the whole ecosystem evolves, thinking about humans as very significant landscape agents, but not as something separate from the landscape. And, you know, that doesn't mean, I mean, you know, as, as modern climate scientists, contemporary climate scientists do, you know, it's now possible to look at any individual storm and to say, okay, a storm in this location at this time of this magnitude would have been almost impossible to occur until, you know, human climate change, right? And I think it is possible, it's plausible. I think some of this, you know, the reason why that work that Tan Chi Xiang did many decades ago, in which I'm now sort of amplifying and uplifting this, um, rec this recognition that there were almost no recorded floods until the 10th century, late 9th century, right? Um, that that represents one version of what the floodplain ecosystem was like. And then this frequently flooded version of the ecosystem was something different and reflects the role of humans as landscape agents. Thank you. And if you don't mind, um, we have, uh, last question from the audience. Um, would you like to share the experience of how you select and call reliable data? Um, especially uh, since mm -hmm. Chinese is, you know, not even your first language. Um, how, how do you do that? 
Right. What uh, I'm really, really lucky and feel um, honored and humbled always that my ability to create these databases relies on the previous publications of works um, exclusively by Chinese scholars, whether that is drawing on something like the Zhongguo Lishi Di Tu Ji, the Historical Atlas of China, or the Zhongguo Wen Wu Di Tu Ji, the Atlas of um, Cultural um, of Cultural Objects, or whether it's like the Huang He Nian Biao, right? All of those works are um, remarkable accomplishments by Chinese scholars who have combed through thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of historical documents and compiled them into maps and into lists and tables and published charts. And um, my database work is really just, in a sense, just kind of humbly following in their footsteps, taking that published work and um, reorganizing it into a format that is um, capable of being um, analyzed by using computational methods. But um, really it's just you know, me taking published existing work by extraordinary Chinese scholars and figuring out what I can do with it if I um, use computational methods. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. And with that, um, we're going to wrap up um, today's talk. I'm really grateful for um, your time and uh, the energy you've um, brought to this discussion. Um, I'm really hopeful um, about the, I'm really looking forward to the Chinese publication of your book. And let's stay, um, I, I, I would love to stay in touch for that. Um, mm -hmm. And as a um, custom, of our Yale Center China, I mean, Yale Center Beijing talks, what we do, what we like to do at the end of each talk is ask for those of you who are able to turn on your cameras, to turn them on um, so we can take a group shot and um, we'll, we, you can be unmuted to um, say thank you to Professor Mostern. So I'm gonna count down from, uh, from five and then we'll take a quick group shot. And I say, Yale or Pitt will still get a smile. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, everyone for all the thank great. Thank you so much. And thank you, you, um, thank you. everyone for all thank the you great. So thank, much. Much. You. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank